Okay, so today is a very interesting video. We have Dr. Arushi Chaudhary with us. She is doing MD medicine in uh, Kim's uh, Bhuvaneshwar. So she she visited our hospital, and while discussion with her, we she had a very brilliant idea that sir. Many of the residents who are newly posted in the intensive care unit. So on day one, they have a lot of anxiety. So can we tell them or can we make a video uh, like what are the basic things and instruments and equipments? What are the basic protocols one new resident should know or should have an idea on day one so that they can be more confident when they are posted in the intensive care unit. So it, uh, the idea was very brilliant. So we thought of making it. So in today's session, um, what we'll do is we'll discuss some of the important equipments which are used in ICU, some of the important protocols which needs to be known by the resident who is posted on day one. And Ayurushi is so kind enough that she has noted down all the things in her diary so that we don't miss out in between uh, in the session. So the flow of this today's session will be she will keep asking the things which uh, she feels should be known by the uh, residents and the camera will move to and fro. Uh, in different scenes so that we can uh, focus on different aspects which one should know. So Arushi, you can start uh, asking and then I will try my best to answer those questions. First of all, thank you sir. Thank you for inviting me on this channel. I have seen a lot of videos of you sir and uh, all the informative content it is uh, on YouTube. It has been very helpful to me and uh, I've used it in the practical uh, aspects also of my clinical um, career. Sir, uh, first of all, uh, how, how, what is the difference between uh, ward and um, ICU as far as equipments uh, are concerned? I mean, uh, what all equipments uh, are extra in um, ICU? Got it, got it. So the first thing is why uh, we keep certain patients in the ward and why we keep certain patient in the intensive care unit. So that's the question. I think we can till later on take, a, take uh, on the equipments. So you need to understand whenever the patient's physiological parameters are deranged in a ward and they are deranged up to a certain extent, whether the airway, blood pressure, circulation or anything which cannot be managed in the ward per se, it requires more support, then they are shifted to ICU. You can see by the name itself, it's intensive care unit, means the care becomes so intensive in such patients. So, so in ICU, basically, if you ask me, there are three sort of patients which are shifted. One, they are not critical per se, but they can come become critical if we are we have not monitored them properly. So like, like your post-op patients, uh, you have post-op patients, like you have undergone surgery or uh, some for observations of head injury patients are there they have certain lesions in the brain they are currently comfortable but the swelling may increase and they may deteriorate so these are category one patients which are not critical at the moment but they may become critical if certain things are not taken care of or when certain uh, actions are not taken timely in those patients now on the extreme we have different patients category three patients which are very sick which are on multiple supports and the chances of improving or the prognosis is very bad for them the chances of survival are very very minimal but still we are trying if we can pull them back if, you know, but we know that most of the efforts which we are trying are going to be futile but we need to provide care to such patients then in between are the most important patients or i would say these are the patient in which you should have lot of concern these are the patients who are critical in which lots of intervention are going on and if it becomes successful the chance of survival of such patients are very high they may be on ventilator they may be on vasopressor supports they may be on dialysis like more and lots of things so these category two patients are very very prime and here the timely intervention can save the patient so these sort of the numbering may differ but usually triaging is done in such a manner one two three so whenever a resident enters the icu he should have a feel that what are category 1 patients, what are category 2 patients, what are category 3 patients because category 2 patients are there where your effort can change their uh, destiny at times. So for them you need to be more focused. So you should make a sheet and then try to define what is category 1, what is category 2, what is category 3 sort of issue. So triaging should be done in that manner. Now other than that. Well, if what you asked is regarding the equipments. Yes, so, sir. before jumping onto equipments, any patient resident who is entering in the intensive care, one thing I should make sure if you are seeing this instrument which is there, uh, I wish you can you pull this up, Sterlium. 
so this is the hand wash this is sterlium uh, this is a uh, alcohol based uh, solutions chlorhexidine solutions alcohol is also there it is very very important so anybody who is posted in icu should be very 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 familiar and should be very strict with himself or herself regarding hand washing before there are five steps of uh, five points where you should hand wash you can go on the who side before touching the patient after touching the patient exposure to the patient liquids uh, any procedure and so on so touching the surrounding so any patient, any person who is and uh, entering the icu should be very familiar should be well versed with hand washing because it is the only thing which can prevent the cross infection infection control in infection control this plays a major role now um, after that uh, i think we can move to um, sir uh, what all monitor uh, okay so uh, will tell us about the patient condition so i think for that i need to we need to move the camera a little bit closer we'll do that okay so when a patient is admitted into the icu the first thing you start is monitoring the patient so how will you monitor you will need a monitor system for that so we put electrodes on the patient's chest and you connect this to the ventilator so commonly there are many functions in this monitor but commonly what are the things which you see in the monitor you see uh, there are a screen which is showing this different sort of parameters and this can be altered by going into the settings of the monitor so first thing which is there is arushi is the ecg uh, ecg means it will show you the continuous rhythm of the patient which is going on it gives you lot of information what is the heart rate of the patient then uh, whether the heart rate is uh, bradycardia or tachycardia if there is any arrhythmia a patient is having any arrhythmia for that matter like patient can be having APCs atrial fibrillation yeah. your uh, apcs are coming vpcs are coming we so did. this gives a fair idea you can adjust the gain and all those things on the monitor the first and foremost thing which is very important is your rhythm rhythm means what is ec second is your uh, saturations continuous uh, monitoring of the saturation uh, is going on so spo2 is being monitored you see a plethysmograph which shows that um, uh, spo what is the spo2 of the patient so by that you know what is the oxygenation status of the patient then you have an nib and an ibp means non invasive blood pressure monitoring now non invasive means that's the there is a uh, blood, um, blood pressure cuff which is there on the patient's hand and it is uh, there and the machine in machine you can set the timing whether it should inflate every 5 minutes whether it should inflate every 15 minutes whether it should inflate every 30 minutes or whether it should inflate 60 minutes so suppose you have said that uh, the it should inflate at 60 minutes interval so at 1 am it will inflate and record the blood pressure and that will get displayed here but now you are seeing the patient at 130 and you see that the blood pressure is coming is 100 by 60 or 120 by 60 that is not the blood pressure at 130 uh, at, at uh, when the clock is showing 130 that is the blood pressure which the which the bp cuff has taken previously at 1 a, at 1 at a. o'clock so it depends on how much duration for common uh, commonly we set it to 1 one, uh, one hour in some cases 30 hour because continuous inflammation and deflation also injures the patient's arm also so you need to be aware that this blood pressure when it was inflated and when it got deflated so this then you have a respiratory rate also there but all those who are working in the icu i will say that don't rely on the respiratory rate on the monitor you always look at the patient how your patient's respiration is how your patient's uh, respiratory efforts are there whether their patient is uh, tachypneic or not it may happen that patient either here respiratory rate is showing 18 but there can be a little bit of nasal flaring on the patient's um, body and face and you can pick the respiration don't too much rely on the respiratory rate of the monitor always look at the patient then you have some alarm buttons here when the there are alarm settings when if the if you set like heart rate below 60 and above 100 it should give the alarm or if there is arrhythmia or if the apc is the patient, it should get alarm so whenever some alarm comes you can check what are the, why the alarm is coming you can silence the alarm immediately or the, you can silence the alarm for one minute uh, duration like that then you have cuff inflation uh, uh, system like i have told you that the bp cuff inflated if one hour duration it was on one clock and it not on 130 now you want i want to check the blood pressure right now so you just put the inflation uh, button and then the bp cuff was inflated at that time 
so these are the uh, some basics of uh, monitor which you uh, see yes sir hai na so you you got an idea so yes, this sir. is the monitor don't be scared of it any uh, monitor which is not attached to monitor just go and see the controls what are the setting it has a lot of settings most of them are go, go unused so go and play with this monitor it will give you a lot of information so i wish i think yes, the monitor is enough now second thing i think uh, which uh, needs to be done is abc if we say whenever you uh, have an acs acls protocol abc should be so first thing when a patient is shifted to icu the thing which you take care is the airway yeah man so how the airway can be managed so uh firstly obviously you need to see whether the patient is able to breathe comfortably or not comfortably then we'll discuss the intubation later on but if the patient is desaturating how we will provide the oxygen to the patient so you can provide oxygen in firstly if the by nasal cannula it has no two nasal prongs and up to 6 liter you can provide uh, if more than 6 liter you provide the nasal uh, mucosa will get dried up and there are chances of crusting and then bleeding will be there if you require more than 6 liter you can give uh, a face, face mask. mask face mask will be, uh, can be there Okay, brother can you show me any nasal cannula or mask by the time we'll explain later on so after that and one bipap mask also if you can provide so so we have uh, nasal cannula then you have uh, face mask then you have if even on 6 to 10 liters patient is not able to breathe comfortably and patient is requiring lot of effort then we have bipap bipap so bipap machine can provide what it will do bipap will push the air to the patient's face and through the trachea to the lungs so that it can uh, give support during inspiration expiration it will help the patient to calm down hmm. mostly it is useful in copd patient or in ccf patients then i think the cannula has come face mask nasal cannula so this is nasal cannula i think there are two nasal probes uh, you can see if you can see here i i see you can see yes sir uh these are two nasal prongs mm-hmm. which goes into the patient nose then you have a face mask this is a face mask this face mask which can provide which gets onto the patient face and then bipap mask this is bipap mask i'm not sure it's but this is a bipap mask you can see we have made a video on this so this is a bipap mask it gets uh, you can take it it get uh, fitted on the patient face and you connect it to the bipap machine so bipap machine is also there in the icu but the problem it uh, problem with bipap machine is it can provide oxygenation only up to 60 60% of the uh, fio2 but if your patient is still desaturating on it then you need NIV to will go. you will go to the niv yeah. non invasive ventilation and non invasive ventilation will get connect to this ventilator machine we'll discuss in a, a few minute so um, then with niv you can provide 100% fio2 also to that patient but now if the patient is not able to tolerate niv also patient is become desaturated or patient become retaining co2 when patient become drowsy then you need to take on invasive mechanical ventilation so for invasive mechanical ventilation you need to put an endotracheal tube and uh, do an embu and uh, uh, give an endotracheal put an endotracheal tube and connect it to the uh, ventilator so okay so can you show me uh, the endotracheal tube okay so this is your laryngoscope which you will need to put the uh, uh, which you need, you need to put uh, for endotracheal tube so first can you show me the embu embu yes, mask sir, is here embu mask is here so this is an embu mask if you can see so it is a closed one it gets open there is, when it pulls out and there is a mask on it you put it on the patient face and there is a reservoir in between the reservoir needs to be uh, inflated and when it's get inflated with oxygenation it connect to the oxygen make it a full flow 15 liters and when it gets filled it can provide up to 100% of oxygen you just put it on the patient face you do an embu yes, and then rightly this is the laryngoscope which arushi was showing so this is the handle 
at that time it will have um, uh, batteries in it and these are the different different blades of the laryngoscope the technique is very simple people struggle it you can see here uh, uh, this is uh, this is what you called is I think the rod is there something and this is the socket so you just want how do you handle it like this you put it in the socket and just with the pressure of thumb it get clicked and then it gets open like that again and when you need to remove you just put a pressure here and it will get removed don't struggle it again with this uh, this is the uh, socket here and this is a rod here you just put it like this click it and open it this is the way laryngoscope so there are different types of laryngoscope different uh, shapes and sizes now once you have <laughs> Uh, taken care of the laryngoscope then the th another thing which you will need is endotracheal tube so this is your endotracheal tube you get it so they are it comes in different shapes and sizes the shape and you see can hear the number is written here eight number tube so commonly used are 7.5 for females 7 7.5 females and for uh, eight, 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 for eight, eight, eight and 8.5 for males. males so this and you can see the black markings here uh, the black marking should go inside the vocal cord so this way you can intubate the patient and now we'll discuss the ventilator what are the ventilator we'll switch the camera near the ventilator okay okay so now you have monitored the patient you have connected the patient on ventilator i'm oh, sorry on the monitor now you take care of the airway so you have dried with nasal prongs you have tried with face mask then an iv then bipap uh, sorry bipap and an iv now you want to put the patient on mechanical ventilator so you have intubated the patient you want to connect it so the first and foremost things this is the ventilator machine this this is the graphical uh, system, uh, display you have different buttons you have different connections now the first and foremost thing which anyone should know about ventilator is where to switch on the ventilator most of the people uh, uh, play around this but there are times they don't know from where uh, it gets started so i wish can you switch on this okay okay yes it gets started so this from is here. Right? so there are different different machines are there in which there are different, different some get uh, started from the back some get started from the front so you should know where is the on off switch now uh it is a demo mode so we'll just show you what are the different things so these are the uh set these are this is the panel where what you have set on the ventilator is displayed and these are the parameters which you have set will get displayed this is to adjust the settings and this is here where where the actual parameters of the patient will get displayed what are the uh, tidal volume what are the respiratory rate you have uh, showing and these are the graphs <coughs> where the different different graphs will get displayed by which you can see what is happening to the patient and the, like now so ventilator for if you want to know about ventilator we have a detailed video on the ventilator in part one and part two in first we discuss the basics of ventilator in the second we discuss the graphs of the ventilator you can go and see but for um, record we are telling you uh, what are the different parts you have three connections which are coming uh, three, uh, two or three connection one is your oxygenation which is coming then in some uh, ventilator air pressure also starts to comes then and the, the other is your electricity and at the bottom you need to put an expiratory wall like the uh, uh, filter like this and you have an inspiratory filter is there an inspiratory filter also there no okay i think it's not there okay but there is an inspiratory filter also in the patient and these are the tubings these are the tubings if you can see these are the tubings if you can see from here yeah uh, i think okay now you see th these are the tubings now you can see so these connect the ventilator to the endotracheal tube one takes the oxygen to the, the patient and the other brings the carbon dioxide back to this patient now so what are the modes on this ventilator so basically you need to understand that there are major uh, now if i just put the camera back okay so there are mainly uh, three modes on the ventilator on any ventilator which you need to understand is one is a control mode 
in control mode means uh, we are putting the patient in sedated and knocked down state and the, all the control of the patient's breathing is taken by this ventilator. Yeah. If we are providing 10-15 breaths per minute, so patient will be receiving only 15 breaths per minute. Now it can be have an assist control also in between if the patient triggers a breath, the patient ventilator will provide the breath. Secondly, mm, the second mode is SIMV, synchronized intermediate ventilatory ventilation. Means some breaths are taken by the patient, some breaths are uh, taken by given by the ventilator. ventilator. Then you have pressure support mode or some say CPAP mode also, in which patient triggers the breath, but the breath is not adequate to generate the enough tidal volume, so ventilator supports the patient by providing extra effort, extra sub pressure support. So the tidal volume is generated. So that is pressure support. And once the patient is comfortable on pressure support, minimal pressure support, then you put the patient on TPs. What is TPs? Can you show me? This is this is TPs. So what you will do on the oxygen endotracheal tube, you connect this oxygen, uh, this is this uh, oxygen delivery system. And then when it connects, gets connected, where is the endotracheal tube? Endotracheal tube, oh, can you? So on this endotracheal tube, when this gets connected, so it forms a shape of T, like this. So you call it, it's a T piece. So once the patient tolerates T piece for 30 to 120 minutes, then you extubate the patient. So this is about the ventilator. Here are the different settings of the alarm, the you know, different buttons. So this sort of machine will be there in your ICU. So um, I think we have taken care of the airway. Now yeah. we'll take care of we'll take care of the circulation. circulation. So, so we'll move to the bedside now. Sir, now we have taken care of the airway and breathing. What all things do we need to know in ICU regarding circulation? Okay, so now ABC, we have taken airway and breathing. In circulation, we need to take care of the blood pressure. So how will you do that? So first and foremost thing which you need to require is giving IV fluids and medication to the patient. So how will you do that? You will have peripheral intracath. In peripheral lines, you will take intracath, uh, different sites of intracaths are there. But it happens that in patients, uh, they are very dehydrated and they are multiple picks has been already been taken in the ward or they are having very solo and they have anasarka uh, on their body. So it, it becomes very difficult to uh, find uh, the veins in such patients, peripheral veins. Also, it may happen that you need to require, give certain medications which are, which cannot be given by the peripheral line. They may exclavacate and can damage the limbs. Also, um, certain medications are there which need very fine adjustments if they are given too fast or too rapidly they will uh, uh, they can have any side effects and their adjustment needs to be precisely defined so for that matter we need two things one is your central line mm, i think here is the central line if i can show you you can brother can you come here yes sir and just put this to the close to the camera and show them okay okay ah, now come so this is a central line. What happens in this central line is you you have a, I think I can go there and show them. Yes. So this is a central line you can see here. So what is happens is there is a long intra, uh, cat, you can say this is a central cannula and you have different different gadgets to insert it. You insert it by shielding the cat. So what is central line? So uh, I'll show this. Central line means all these your peripheral lines are getting uh, tributaries are getting connected and in the central circulation they are merging in the central circulation which is your heart so all the lines which are close to the heart in the axial uh, uh, axis you call is central circulation and then you um, put and whenever you put a line in them you will call it a central line so what are the places where you can put a central line you have two subclavians two internal jugular and two femorals you can take so there are six sites you can see now because we are discussing the uh, locations what are what is the preferred one so if you go by the literature subclavian line is the preferred because it gives a good mobility to the patient the chances of infections are less but the problem is it is non-compressible site if the certain bleeding happens it cannot be compressed subclavian also there is a theoretical risk and also practical risk of pneumothorax because its needle can puncture your the patient lungs. 
so the second best option is internal jugular this is one of the commonest one which is used it is it also gives a good mobility and the chance of pneumothorax are low and also uh, chance of infections are uh, a little high as compared to subclavian but it is also very low proper care is taken but also here is also the problem if some bleeding happens here during the entering or something or later on when you give heparin some oozing happens you cannot compress it you can compress but you cannot compress it to a more extent because what will happen it can in too much compression can uh, compress the trachea and it will compromise the airway so what you need is a compressible site for that femoral so in the groin when you insert in the femoral it is good for patients in which you don't get any SS and a patient is having coagulopathy you insert line there and if something happens you can compress it with a full force so you can uh, the chance of bleeding earlier but because it is near the groin the chance of infections are low for, for so high, for high uh, sorry high chance of infections are high in femoral line so for practical purposes you need to internal jugular vein is one of the commonest one which is used in this part of this uh, uh, setup so read about central line what are the complications so oozing pneumothorax you can have so whenever you are having a patient in central line you need you will understand that the certain medication which are going on which you can only be given this line or patient don't have any access for them now when we are talking about central line one thing which you also need to understand is the, the machines these are the infusion pumps these are many infusion pumps so what are infusion pumps infusion pumps are the things which by uh, with the medication which needs to require very fine adjustment and they have a very short life like you have your vasopressors and anotropes patient is having adrenaline noradrenaline vasopressins dopamine dobutamine they are given through the infusion pump because very fine adjustment is required secondly osmotic highly osmotic active agents like potassium or sodium chloride or three percent highly concentrated or insulin also needs to begin because very fine adjust if too much insulin is given patient can have hypoglycemia if less is given the glycemia control will not happen so these are the infusion pumps which are used for that so uh, circulation is taken care by your uh, central lines and infusion pumps like that and peripheral cannulas if for the uh, if it is not there okay so uh, so we have taken care now so you have put the patient monitor you have taken care of their way you have taken care of the circulation now once you do that you need to feed the patient also so nutritional support is also required so those patients who can take orally it's very easy you can provide them the calculate the amount of uh, uh, feed required for them and feed them protein diet low potassium diet diabetic diet like that but if the patients are not able to fed properly then we have what we will call is one of the very common uh, in, in thing is your rail tube insert which we call is nasogastric Naso tube insertion it a, by putting a local jelly it get inserted and it goes through the nose and it uh, lands in the stomach and which helps to decongest the stomach also and you can feed them to hourly feeding and some continuous feeding also can be there uh, by the gravity pumps we can do you have also nasojejunal also which goes through the nose and can go into the jejunum there is a gastric stasis in the uh, stomach it is very helpful in pancreatitis per se but nasogastric is preferred so now if we cannot feed the patient uh, from ng tube also yes, sir. then uh, total parental nutrition also is then provided you use tpn so tpn usually is given by central lines peripheral solutions are also available but make sure whenever you are giving tpn through a central line always dedicate one port for it because too much handling in from that port uh, give rise to lot of infection, infection. so whenever you're giving tpn if there is a, is a bag which is white sort of bag is there white material and then um, it's got get connective central line and whenever the patient knows tpn you need to supplement some element which are not there in the tpn so trace elements we need to do there so because once you feed the patient then you have to take care of the motions also whether the patient has passed motion or not whether the patient is a like abdominal video so uh, ideally an iso within 48 hours at least one motion should be passed by the patients and if too much motions are passing then you need to take care so that is feeding part now what we need to discuss is okay urine output. now whenever patient is passing, we need to take care of the urine urination also very very important in the icu 
a patient should pass a minimal amount of urine because if that urine is not passing a lot of fluid and a lot of toxic metabolites uh, gets accumulated in the body which will be harmful to the patient so patient can self void you can do that if not then we can insert is a police catheter this they, they comes in sorry sorry they can come color in, coded they are color coded similarly nasogastric tube is also okay. color coded and they are comes in different different the common one which you use is 16 hmm you can show them go and so in front of uh, just focus for one second okay so this is 16 and you can uh, beyond 16 it usually damaging to the urethra but at times required if there is a leak and uh, a small, uh, smaller one yes can be done so you need to uh, monitor this urine it should be minimum 0.5 ml per kg per hour and if very high urine is also coming that is also uh, uh, not good like in diabetes insipidus or uh, diuresis and if it is too much low is coming then the patient is landing you so how will you measure it so as arushi has pointed out arushi has pointed out that you will use uh, this is urometer this is urometer you will see hanging from the patient bed so how, what will happen the it uh, the urine gets collected in this urometer every hour you know how much urine is coming and then you empty in the bag which is attached to it and then again it get becomes empty and then again the nursing staff sees note it down and then so per hour urine measurement a, a bag without a urometer we call as a urine bag which is used in the wards but in ice tube almost all ice tube shift as soon as the patient shift they switch is to urometer because it's very important to measure the hourly so we'll have urometer hanging with the patient's bed so we have taken care of airway breathing circulations we have feed the patient and then we have taken care of the urinations now once we have take uh, talking about urination if the urine is suppose urine is not coming properly so how will you do what are the options available uh, renal replacement therapy so in the icu you will have dialysis machine also right now i think it's we are not in the dialysis unit it's not there if we are in the other part of the icu so you have a dialysis machine you can go and check uh, the images on the net so what are the different type of dialysis you have we call is rrt renal replacement therapy so mainly there are three types one is your intermittent hemodialysis ihd then you have slow low efficacy dialysis which is sled and the third one is uh, crrt, CRRT. continuous renal replacement therapy they are self excellent term intermittent hemodialysis usually the routine one which takes in 4 3 to 4 hours it's get completed it is very good for removing toxic metabolites like potassium urea because the flow is high and it gets filtered out very easily in if the but uh, it also remove the fluid also but the problem is it gives a um, flux, uh, uh, it changes the blood pressure too much mm. there is a chance that the patient is hemodynamically unstable your blood pressure can fall during this dialysis so in hemodynamically unstable patient we have sled slow left we get acid dialysis it is extended for 8 to 10 hours duration so when it is extended to 8 to 10 hours duration the benefit is your blood pressure remains stable but the problem is the filtration pressure reduces so your metabolites will not get excreted in the amount which is required but at least better than if you can't do any dialysis for that matter but it's a good option it's one of the most common modality which is used in the icu in terms of dialysis then in certain icus you have crrt for 24 hours the dialysis is going on and uh, uh, the patient is put on 24 hour dialysis and slowly the uh, uh, metabolites are it's a costlier one also also it has it needs to be anticoagulated Different, different things to be maintained. So, sled is something which is very commonly used. So, sir, and uh, if the patient is bedridden for uh, many days, what all prophylaxis one should take in ICU? Uh, very nice. So, to prevent any okay uh, thrombosis in the veins. So, we need to prevent two things. In a patient who is sedentary in the ICU, we need to prevent two things. One is pressure source. pressure so where the patient is bed written so it can have pressure so in the back uh, in the buttock area 
any where where is the pressure areas oh, and they are bloated also they are a lot of edema is also there so for that you need require air mattress and nowadays good air mattress coming which are having a wave like movement every uh, every minute is going on so air mattress should patient should be on air mattress secondly the thing which can happen is they can develop deep vein thrombosis in the legs dvt is one of the most undiagnosed disease in the icus so we provide two we can handle it by two ways one obviously you need to have a scoring system whether this patient is at risk or not well so, scoring yeah, well score is there so then uh, you can do it you can prevent it by either by pharmacological measure you provide low molecular weight heparin if it is not a uh, contraindication is there so, and the other one is pneumatic sequential pneumatic compression devices there is a, a, a device which the pumps uh, intermittently in both the calf muscles and keep the circulation of the limbs adequate so they are they are in the icu at times we used both at times we used both other than that one which very uh, nicely ayushi has ki if a sedentary patient what all things we need to do so for that because it's a busy environment many times you can miss something so there is a mnemonic which you call is fast hack bid feeding and is analgesia sedation like that so fast hack bid will go on the net and you will see that basic things on fast hack bid you have a lot of things are there if you just in a patient just tick mark it ki this has done this has done this has done so fast hack bid should be known like f starts for feeding a for analgesia s for sedation like on that in fast hack bid it hardly takes 30 seconds but many things are uh, not missed right so always try to de escalate the antibiotics by all motions and all those things are there sir in uh, covid times i have heard of a new machine ecmo sir what all um, is a principle of that machine okay so like dialysis when we were discussing ki uh, if your kidneys are not functioning you can take help of the dialysis machine because that's the work which the kidney should do and the dialysis machine is doing same way if your lungs are in a state that they are not able to oxygenate uh, properly and they are not able to remove the carbon dioxide they become so stiff so then your ecmo helps in the full form is extra corporeal membrane oxygenation ecmo so what is extra corporeal means outside the body and it is oxygenating the blood so how it will do do the do the thing <coughs> sorry it will take the uh, blood from a vein a central vein uh, goes into the machine it oxygenates the blood and it comes back and again goes to the vein so it bypasses the lungs so your ecmo machine maintains the oxygenation carbon dioxidation of the uh, body uh, patient now this is vv ecmo because we are taking uh, blood from the vein and putting into a vein now if your heart is also failing it's not able to maintain the circulations then you take the blood from the vein and uh, goes to the machine oxygenate and with the help of a pump it pushes the blood with a certain pressure into the arteries so it will it is called va ecmo so it will take care of the oxygenation as well as the circulation so in circulatory failure with hypoxia you use va ecmo also because you have asked whether in covid times new machine there is one more thing is hfnc high flow nasal cannulation or high flow nasal oxygenation where because i have told with uh, your face mask you cannot provide uh, oxygenation beyond 50 55% but hfnc or nasal prongs there is separate machine in which flow with a high uh, means with a high flow oxygenation up to 100% can be given by nasal prongs so obviously it can damage nasal uh, uh, mucous membrane but it provides oxygenation and we can avoid ventilation in such patients there are trials between niv and dry uh, and head to head trial with an niv and hfnc so if oxygenation is only the problem hfnc can help but if your ventilation part is also respiratory muscle fatigue is also there then niv is a better choice so hfnc is there ecmo is there one more thing regarding like for dialysis and ecmo just like a central line you need cannula with a bigger bore like this is a dialysis cannula okay so you can see the in both the machines this in this central line the lumen of this uh, central uh, cannula is less you can see i think i'm not able to show i'll come you can see this is a central line and this is a thin cannula 
and when you can see arrow through there and this is a dialysis and you can see the cannula is a thicker one so these are it is also the dialysis cannula is also inserted in all those three locations uh, your, you can see the difference mm -hmm. Hmm. so also inserted in the same position Fem uh, your subclavian femur uh, IJV and femoral ECMO needs more uh, amount of blood so it has a very large bore cannulas so they are inserted in femoral femoral or femoral femor take from the femoral and go to the femoral or take from the um, uh, femoral and go to the uh, sub, uh, sub no, no, so IJV sort of. so these are different so their cannulas are large and they require special techniques to get inserted anything which is we, we are left with it or any uh, something remaining yes sir uh, sir about abg is uh, okay very very important so, bread and butter of any icu specialist okay. so these are the things these are the instruments some uh, some are some instruments are there i think we will cover in the end but anyone who is working in the icu sh mandatorily they should know how to read an abg in an ABG, it, it provides a lot of information about the patient. It provides oxygenation status, CO2 status, your pH status, your bicarb, your electrolyte. I think we had a rough report also there on ABG here. I think we had a... Okay. This is your ABG. This is your ABG report. This is, this is a patient report. You can see the parameters here. You can go and uh, check on the net also. So this is an ABG in which this is a very, very important tool in investigation which give you immediate understanding of what is going on with the patient, whether the patient is critical or non-critical or we have time. Lactates levels are there, bicarbs are there, pH are there. So one who is entering the ICU, one should be very well versed with the ABG. You can go and check our uh, video on the channel on uh, how to read an ABG. So we, we in between we also post some examples also you can go and read them. So and similarly ICU chart. Uh... Mm -hmm. So this is a very very important tool. I think everybody this is a very informative chart. So ICU chart is so important that it gives a lot of information about what I wouldn't say a lot. It gives almost every information which is going on with the patient. How much fluid is going on? What is the blood pressure? What is the urine? How much is the feed is given? What medications were need to be given? Bolus? How are the infusions going on? So those who are posted on the in the ICU, they should for six months they should read and go and read every chart and try to correlate what went wrong, what went good, what are the things. So ICU, reading ICU chart is a very very important thing and try to calculate things in it, it will give you a better understanding of the uh, patient. So, Sir, uh, and, uh, last but not the least, uh, what about the disposal of uh, urine and stool and what about the biomedical uh, mm. waste management in the ICU? I think if I can show you, mm. uh, I'll show you, there are uh, biomedical segregations are there, there are, uh, if, are there sir, empty bins brother, can you bring and tell me? There are different color coded bins which are kept there. If I can just focus. So there are different different bins which are there. <laughs> it will be difficult but I can keep it there. It's like these. And red. So this is red. And the one is black. I think one is ice cream. So these are the different types of uh, bins which are there. You can take it now. So in which gloves needs to be put, in which sharp containers needs to be put, in which uh, your um, other wrappers needs to be put. So these are segregated and they are disposed of uh, accordingly. What are the blood products where need to discard? Everybody should know about it. And I think some if something is missing here, which we need to show some instruments. Uh, one, obviously, the, you have different types of gloves. These are the sterile gloves and the normal gloves. And airway. These are the different airways, uh, different color coded airways, which are there to prevent the tongue fall in certain patients. And 
before concluding, uh, I would also would like to tell that those who are working in the ICU or going to be posted, they should be well versed with ACLS guidelines. What is ACLS protocol? How to give CPR? What are shockable rhythm? What are not shockable rhythm? They should read it once so that they are not in a panic state when some CPR or some patient collapses. So. Um, if something wrong happens with the patient, then in the ICU we also have your defibrillator and crash card. We'll post an image of that uh, while we're discussing. It is at the back of the camera. So we have defibrillator and um, uh, crash card uh, there. So how to use defibrillator, one should know. Well, what are the rhythms which are shockable? What are the rhythms which are not shockable? One should understand. Then some basic uh, algorithms. Uh, some There are five to ten conditions for which patients are frequently admitted like COPD exacerbation, acute MI, stroke, um, poisoning. So you can read them. So you should know what are the management of ACS, how you'll manage acute coronary syndrome, how you'll manage stroke, what are the septic protocols, when you should get antibiotics, not antibiotics. For antibiotic also we have a uh, topic on the channel. So these are the things. Then how to write notes in the ICU. We have also one lecture on that on the channel. So these are the things. The idea what Ayrshi told us that if we can make uh, you understand, uh, get familiar about these all things which are there in the ICU, when you go to the ICU will have a less anxiety and will be more confident uh, while entering on day one in the intensive care unit. Anything remain? No sir. Everything is welcome Anna? sir. So if uh, anything we have missed it, you can ask in the comment section of this video and if you have any suggestion uh, for uh, future sessions like this, you can post also in the comment section. And I really thank Ayrishi for bringing up this idea of making a video like this. Uh, thank you and see you in the next video. Thank you.